Hola, muy buenas tardes. Muchísimas gracias por estar aquí. Mi nombre es Ileana Diego. Hi, good afternoon. Thank you for being here. My name is Ileana Diegues. I am Cuban. I have lived outside of Cuba for several years. And I am grateful to Tania and the Instar team for what they are doing. My talk is titled Theatrality and Performativity from Against Necropolitics. And I will be using a PowerPoint. I think it's important to set forth the coordinates for my talk. I'm not going to be talking about theater and performance art, but about theatricality and performativity. Theatricality and performativity uh, forms of expression proper to the human being can be regarded as expanded devices or strategies for looking or theoretical devices. From the start, theatricality is etymologically connected to theory. In fact, the word theory comes from the Greek, wor Greek word theorein, which means uh, to look, to regard, to contemplate. So I'm interested in this connection between theater and theory. Theatricality has been explored in fictional universes, dramatic universes, sociological, anthropological. I could mention many authors, but I will skip that. I'm just interested in pointing out that theatricality and performativity have been explored in different fields in order to think the stage, and by this I mean the social stage, the streets, for example. For example, the French sociologist Georges Balandier claims that theatricality enables a sociology that is not based on enunciations, but rather on dramatic demonstrations. He also regards that the theorization was originally dramatic in nature. Theatricality has been very important in uh, contemporary art since the second half of the 20th century. Theater itself became more complex by contamination with other languages. And, but even before we were speaking of post-dramatic theater, theatricality has been widespread in all fields and aspects of life and the arts. It's a, a complex and changing, shifting disposition, as Alain Badiou has pointed out. So it cannot be reduced to stage work or the performance of a given text. If we think about the work of John Cage, Merx Cunningham, Fluxus, Viennese actionism, etc., we see that temporality and scenification are everywhere in the visual arts. The conceptual knot that emerged through these hybridizations and contaminations was discussed a decade later by Rosalind Krauss in her landmark essay, Sculpture in the Expanded Field. According to Krauss, the term became enlarged through critical operations of post-war art. I think that the expansion of theatricality was defined in a negative way. I mean to say that at first it began, it was working on the peripheries of theater where there were contamination between boundaries that made room for something that was neither theater nor sculpture, something maybe closer to an installation or a performance. The, so it was, the, here we have the notion of uh, the, another theater framed by Alain Badiou and Tadeusz Cantor with sources that are not dramatic, but rather plastic. But these transformations and expansions of performativity, theatricality and the stage are not simply the result of interdisciplinary disseminations or indisciplinary disseminations. 
but rather through the contamination with the life, everyday life in art and the urgent appeal of situations that emerge during our everyday lives. So to talk about theatricality as an expanded field is not simply a way to acknowledge other kinds of stages and other forms of theater in the crevices between art forms. We are also invited to consider theatricality as an aspect of everyday life and social representation beyond the periphery of the arts. For several years, I've been interested in theatricality and performativity to debate and discuss, analyze street situations and to visibilize the representational devices used by power in order to compel certain forms of behavior and icons for indoctrination. So I have been trying to use these notions in order to analyze areas that are not typically understood as part of the traditional framework of politics. So I'm interested in thinking about the representations of power and the actions of civil society in contexts that are inflected by repressive control and social uprising. Performativity and theatricality coexist in situations of struggle and survival, as well as in spaces of domination. I think they can be understood as strategies that allows us to dismantle any form of power that puts forward a claim to truth and the eternal promise of an, a dream-like world. Malandier argues that power models the real through the imaginary. So the state produces a theater of illusions, in particular in totalitarian societies, which attempt to develop the function of unification to the highest degree. In her thoughts about totalitarian power, Hannah Arendt described the secret police as the executor and guardian of a transformation of reality into fiction. I'm talking about her work, The Origins of Totalitarianism, which, as Tania Bruguera has said, was the prologue to Instar, and which she and her collaborators read out loud in Havana for 100 hours from the, her own house, creating the possibility for Arendt's thoughts on the Nazi and Stalinist concentration camp regimes, which produced the totalitarian model. It was a performativity of dissent that could allow intersubjective explosions. As Tania Bruguera has said, she realized that the Cuba's secret police was an expert in spying and manipulating, and they usually do some research about the people who they are interrogating. So Tania Bruguera says that she thought it would be a great idea to use Hannah Arendt because then the secret police would have to at least read a couple of pages from her book in order to be able to discuss them with me during the next interrogation. So it was a strategic move. My interest in totalitarian complexity is not based on the idea of using this terminology to understand what happens in the island. When we need to quickly define Cuban reality, we often, we might say that it is a dictatorship or talk about totalitarianism, but I have thought uh, how to define with more definition the repressive state that we experience in Cuba. Oddly enough, Carl Friedrich put forward the term totalitarian dictatorship. Also, the Argentine sociologist Claudia Hill has contributed an important framework to this discussion. She refers to the Cuban regime as a dictatorship in connection to Latin American dictatorships, where the military exerts power. But according to Hilp, here dictatorship is a concept that is used in a moral sense rather than in a political sense. It, but, it must be understood in light of uh, 
definitions of totalitarian regimes. According to Hild, the Cuban revolutionary process, quote unquote, is a regime that promotes equality through total domination. She argues lucidly that this so-called utopia has failed economically, and she has analyzed keenly how one man amassed absolute power while being celebrated by so-called progressive Latin American thought. Hilp's book is called Silence Cuba, and in its conclusion, it argues that uh, hopefully the democratic left will give up their shameful silence and their explicit uh, support for the Cuban regime. My purpose in bringing this up is to delve into what I would like to understand as the totalitarian stage or the totalitarian scene. Through theatricality, I try to understand scenes of domination. In this sense, I understand what Rosalind Krauss calls an enlargement of terms. Nicolás Evreinov, one of the first scholars of social theatricality, put forward the notion of theatrocracy as the sole durable regime. I'm trying to understand the scenic weave of totalitarianism to gain access to the dramatic model that has sustained its expansion. What is the representational system of this stage so that we may understand its weave of signs as totalitarian representation? Balandier understands theatricality as a device that amplifies state rhetorics and claims that through theatricality, all political power obtains subordination. He understands the totalitarian machinery as a stage where authority develops its pedagogical functions in order to guarantee complete subjection from the time of public executions during the Inquisition or the so-called foundational sacrifices of the French Revolution, the theater of horror is connected to showcasing decapitations, mutilations, and many other forms of torture. Doubtless, we should say that it is also connected to the dissemination of terror by all possible means in order to secure a space of fear and death. So the political scene becomes tragic when accusations against those who are said to threaten so-called supreme values is used to legitimize physical or moral death. So here I will start presenting some images. Through the rhetorical use of bodies and words, political spectacularity organizes itself in order to publicly sanction transgression. These are people who, are from Cuba, will know what these images show. They have to do with what has been going on during the past few months. This is a typical lynching of the kind we have experienced after July 11. I want to connect my theoretical discussion. I've also uh, dealt with similar situations in Mexico. Through the rhetorical use of bodies and words, political spectacularity organizes itself to publicly sanction transgression. Punitive performativity, which functions through terror, is an important element in the pedagogical toolkit used by the state as part of what Michael Tosik has called proliferation of spaces of death. In her thoughts on what he calls the magic of the state, Tausig uh, talks about a mimesis of death 
which induces a form of representation that can account for the authority of death. Next image, please. In the Cuban case, I would add that there is an intention to produce what Achille Mbembe has called living dead or zombie behaviors. This kind of mimetic organization seeks to reproduce a subject that would be the subject of state being, answerable to the maxim, I die, therefore I exist. How can we think today the notion of totalitarianism in connection with the later and more current notion of necropolitics? Necropowers legitimate themselves through stages that reiterate certain necro scenes. Some are determined by emblems, as in the next image. Emblematic images and stage devices. I'm sorry to present these images. We have seen enough of representations of powers, but it's a, a, by way of example. Some of these necropolitical stages are determined by emblems and scenic arrangements that remind citizens under which coordinates it is possible for them to live or rather to survive. Power always represents itself through the visible part of its ceremonial ordering. Often there is textualization of bodily matter, the use of the body as a message to disseminate pedagogies of fear. This is the famous image of Leonardo Romero seen throughout the world for people who live in Cuba. This calls for no further explanation. What I perceive as theatricality in these scenes is the result of an exercise of looking that seeks to extract meanings from the relations between the parts and elements used to produce a metonymical image with no substitutions, representatives, or metaphors. These are different images of uh, direct repression against the body. So as I say, this is pure metonymy. There is no metaphor here. In this necro theater, the body plays a crucial role as a medium of representation to be seen by others and creates terror. This image is what happened at the entrance to the house of Andy Garcia. I will so show other similar images in other cases as well later on. This happened this year. And we see, see he, how they are using dirt and mud to terrorize in the Cuban context. It's also an allusion to magic by contamination, which has a strong psychic repercussions in our context, this form of magical practice. And this is a way of saying no space is safe. This wasn't even the house of um, this person, but rather the house of their friends or relatives. One morning they found their door ajar. They assumed that maybe the state security has copies of keys to their houses. So it's this form of control where you cannot even count on a personal space of closing the door and feeling safe in your own home. I don't know if you know, Andy Garcia is a political prisoner after the uprising in Santa Clara on July 11. This year, he was uh, used in a kind of experiment. He was taken to a forced labor camp. He completely refused to work for the state and he was sent back to the maximum security prison in Santa Clara. Okay. Bueno, una imagen también que muchos conocen. This is another image that many of you know. I'm so sorry to present these images, but I would like you to understand that in Cuba there is necro power, that we have a necropolitics in Cuba. It's hard to get people to understand this. And I want these uh, images to visibilize how this necro power functions 
to exert control and to disseminate worlds of death. These images speak for themselves. If anyone has any doubts that Cuba is a necropower as defined by contemporary theory, I urge them to examine what is going on in Cuba in terms of producing fear and terror in the population. This is an image from October last year, and I think it's an explicit message of how physical and psychological violence operates. The scene was created with decapitated animals simulating uh, a scene of black magic within the framework of uh, Cuban Santeria. It's as though to say what happened to these animals will happen to you. And this is how narcos operate in Mexico, right? They present mutilated bodies in public space so as to say the same thing will happen to you if you don't do as we say. This is what the Cuban government does with its citizens. To terrorize is one of the purposes that guide necropolitical practices. In a society that has been mythified as the model of Latin American socialism, this kind of necrotheater shows that its ruling regime is configured necropolitically. Violence is by nature instrumental, as pointed out by Hannah Arendt. It is developed for a particular purpose, and although it can never be legitimate, the groups that behold it and use it present it as justifiable. This always generates an aesthetics of death and subjectivities modeled by the territories of fear. The theatricalities of the Cuban state travel between extreme disciplinary arrangements and other more persuasive forms. Images of martyrs laid out on main squares like the Revolution Square in Havana, they reproduce in a constant loop narratives of revolutionary sacrifice, quote unquote, and the motto, socialism of death, prevails as a kind of mandate that you find in the most diverse locations. Everyday uh, locations and public spaces. So death and the mimesis of death everywhere as a shared mandate. These images function panop panoptically in order to, I'm talking about Michel Foucault's panopticon, they function panoptically to remind citizens that they are being surveilled and the privilege of power over death and the need for sacrifice as an offering to power. We Cubans, either uh, we have a uh, our nation, or we prefer death, fatherland or death. So this kind of scene always plays a role in the deviation of these mandates. I agree with Friedrich in talking about a totalitarian dictatorship to connect Cuba with what happened in the dictatorial regimes of the Southern Cone. Many people have argued, I remember Tania has said the same recently, Cuba is no exception. Cuba must be understood in light of other Latin American dictatorial regimes. And when we start to do this, our understanding, a thought on the Latin American left will shift because the Latin American left still prevails in having a fictional understanding of Cuba. They must understand that in Cuba we have uh, dictatorial totalitarianism and the terms themselves are not what is most important. What we need is people to understand that what is happening is very much connected to what happened in the dictatorship 
dictatorships in Argentina, Chile, and Uruguay. So I use the term totalitarian dictatorship to understand the kind of sacrificial gestures that we find, for example, in Chile during the dictatorship. These sacrificial gestures are not, in, the, in this context, an unconscious offering to a regime, but rather as gestures of defiance, as desperate efforts to defend life against the sacrifice demanded by the regime in power. So first I would like to talk about sacrificial gestures. According to Giorgio Agamben, a gesture cannot be reduced to the aesthetic order. It is rather part of ethics and politics. I understand the gesture as a performativity that traverses plasticity and pierces social contracts and expectations of behavior. So they are surprising because they are de-automatized formations in social space. This is how Didi Uberman understands the gesture that Harun Faroqi performs at the beginning of his film, Inextinguishable Fire. Here, Faroqi is, is uh, talking about how difficult it is to, to visualize violence. He's wondering whether images of violence, if it is possible to show the effects of napalm, and he extends his arm and burns the cigarette out in, on his arm. It's a kind of a performance within his documentary. And he says, well, if napalm burns at 3,000 degrees and a cigarette burns at 400 degrees, the image of burning by cigarette will be more tolerable and at the same time reveal the difference in order to challenge spectators' assumptions regarding violence. So Didi Uberman has um, analyzed this gesture by Faroqi and he calls, the, he calls it a surprising gesture. These are gestures that de-automatize our perception. They surprise us and this is uh, how they create what we also called uh, estrangement effects or the fremdungs effect. I would like to connect this with another gesture of protest, much more radical, because in Faroqi's case, it's a metonymy. It only involves one part of the body, but I would like to talk about a gesture that is not recorded in image. In 1983, a, a Chilean citizen, Sebastián Acevedo, set himself on fire at, at, before a cathedral to demand the release of his disappeared children. So I want to analyze this sacrificial gesture when they are not offerings to the state, but when they are uh, deployed in order to, de to defend life against the state. In Havana, defying the panoptical theatricality of the Cuban state, Luis Manuel Otero Alcantara, as you all know, he is now in prison for dissidents. He built a torture device called Garroteville in Spanish, and he exposed his body to a mechanism that rendered him extremely vulnerable in order to embody harassment, and he decided to remain there sitting for five days, eight hours each day. And he invited Cuba's secret police, which was constantly detaining him and surveilling him, to carry out a public execution. As he said on his Instagram account in April 16, 2016, this work, I'm sorry, later on, he said, this work is the result of a series of videos where we denounce how arbitrarily activists and oppositors are harassed in Cuba and is part of a series that he calls Cause Number One, a project initiated in 2019. 
Rather than a work of performance art, I think that this is a radical gesture to place his last position in, in favor of a worthy life. Uh, it's an act of obstinacy. And there is a French thinker, Frédéric Lordon, who discusses activism, and he regards obstinacy as a strategy that is used by activists to shift affects and produce lasting impressions. This object, of course, reminds us of, of acts of sovereign when the sovereign has the power to decide over someone else's life. The machine must be operated by an undertaker. It's a medieval killing machine that was introduced in the Americas to produce exemplary punishment during insurrections. It was legally used in Spain from 1820 until the death penalty was abolished when the new constitution was approved in 1978. It was used for the last time in Spain in 1974 during Franco's dictatorship. And so the same instrument now comes back to life in Cuba in the context of current uh, repression. Luis Manuel's act involves the machine in order to represent punishment in a gesture of uh, subversive, sac uh, sacrificial subversion, which uh, has nothing to do with the sacrificial gestures of martyrs. It points the gaze towards the undertaker who operates the machine. This image is very upsetting because against all of the redemptive discourses disseminated by the state, the image of a young black man reminds us of a moment when enslaved black bodies did not matter, as is the case nowadays with the bodies and lives of any dissident in Cuba. I'm, I'm, I'm saying they don't matter to power, right? I want to be very clear. Uh, power does not care about those bodies. Of course, they matter greatly to us, to all of us, to all citizens of Cuba and other nations. The metonymic process activated by this machine also refers, creates analogies between repressed and repressive bodies. It's not so much a performance, it is a gesture. It configures a radical form of being in life through art or through any other kind of practice. Although it, it is created out of the differential surplus of art, the space that creators have, this idea of a differential surplus was coined by an Argentinian Peruvian theorist. It is a moment where a gesture for life takes on an aesthetic form, but also is of kind of agency. It is an ethical act conceived in aesthetic form. The subtraction of the object and the destruction of the work, the theft and damage of other of his works, led to a chain of events that included hunger strikes, hospital imprisonment, and eventually imprisonment for Luis Manuel today. He is in a maximum security prison in Guanajuato. According to the sentence, he is there um, because he carried out works of performance art in public spaces, seemingly in order to protest situations and issues that exist in the country. For example, he used the flag, and we know that everywhere in the world the flag has been used by artists without being led to them, to their imprisonment. Even when Fujimori was dictator in Peru, people protested with the flag on the streets and nobody went to prison. And these are well-known Latin American dictatorship. 
and yet in Cuba, somebody is in prison for having used uh, the flag. I think that this uh, urgent ethical gesture by Luis Manuel is now written in our memories. And it is, it is now part of a canon of similar gestures everywhere in the world. Tania Bruguera argues for the ethical dimension of aesthetics. And I think that she does this in conversation with the thought of Mikhail Bakhtin. According to Bakhtin, every poetic is the aesthetic form of ethical action with no alibis for being. Tania Bruguera's work as an artist and uh, artivist displays ways of consistently dismantling the machinery of power and enabling the right to civic life. I think that what INSTAR is doing here in Documenta is part of Tania's understanding of art as a shared experience, a moment with a political time and a specific energy. I think that our present here is part of a vital necessity. It's not just that we are here as uh, researchers, artists, activists. We are here because we want to say over and over again that we care about Cuba and that it belongs to us and not to the state. As Mariela Brito has said, and she's here right now, making art is a, an exercise of citizenship. She understands the role of theater in this sense as follows. I quote her, theater has in a smaller scale taken on the role of the press or the public square. It's a quality that is fairly unique and it responds to the very origins of the theater, its ritual nature, its capacity for shaking and moving the guts and brains in a collective and subversive action. You find this in an interview published on August 30, 2022 in Hypermedia magazine. Uh, so I, I want to thank Mariela Brito and the, her interviewer and Nelda Castillo, who are both here. They are clear examples of resistance. We should then be able to think the performativities that traverse and agitate practices. No matter how they are expressed, we're interested about the energy that drives them and the deep connections between the non-hierarchical communitas that art can generate and transformative processes, even long term. Some, According to some scholars, the concept of civil society is opposed to totalitarianism. This is why the performativities of dissent or are crucial in the existence of a civil society which is often most damaged by totalitarian excess. Although in Cuba there is a state of terror through the stigmatization and punishment of oppositors, civil society has taken the streets and they continue to do so. And they insist on exercising their rights they are paying a high price for this, according to reports by the groups Justicia 11J and Cuba Lex. Almost uh, 1,500 people have been detained, most of them young people between 20 and 25 years of age. More than 50 are underage and over 50 are women who are in prison and subjected to torture, punishment, lack of medical assistance. The report, uh, the, A Year Without Justice, it's the title of the report, most of the people who are now imprisoned, 1,381, that is to say 93% of the people who were detained, are not part of any political organization or civil society organization. And they are not, they don't collaborate with any media outlet. I mean, they are citizens, everyday average citizens with no political affiliation for or against uh, Cuba's Communist Party. They went out to exert their right to protest in public space and they are in prison. Today, the Cuban regime 
It's a tragic theater, busy at producing the moral and physical death of hundreds of young people. If we consider how they put into practice their repressive policies, it seems easy to affirm that there is a necropolitical regime in Cuba with forms of totalitarian control, much like the Soviet model. We were educated under panoptical devices disguised as a local neighborhood organizations. What we know of the committees for the defense of the revolution, which are basically lynch mob organizations. As a result, the apparatus of the secret police is the most efficacious institution in the island the most feared and also the most unwanted. As Hannah Arendt pointed out in the totalitarian model, you find a system of ubiquitous espionage where anyone may be a police agent and everyone feels constantly surveilled. Totalitarian theatricality deploys a panoptical device that can produce zones of sociopolitical surveillance that renders all citizens into potential enemies and creates a mimesis of death. According to Arendt, the destructive operations in these contexts are not isolated episodes. They are the institution of terror as such. In her study about power in Cuba, Claudia Hill argues that fear is a passion for the current regime. When she analyzes how discourse shifted from celebrating virtue into celebrating obedience and terror, she does argues that outright fear in every aspect of society has the purpose of modeling behavior according to the desires of the regime. Fear is the organizing passion of the Cuban regime, according to Claudia Held. A politics of fear entails a system of representation and a set of performativities directed at creating social fear under the certainty that everything is under control. This has also semiotic uh, repercussions, as Yuri Lotman has pointed out. When you live in fear, you have a perception of danger coming from a part of society qualified as the other. This must be a minority that is feared, but that can also be hunted down. This is the construction under which Lotman analyzed European contexts that exemplified a culture of fear, especially in the second half of the 15th century and until the early 17th century. So the feared object is a particular social construct. It is regarded as an organized minority and representative of the forces of evil, such as in the communities of uh, witches and other agents who are regarded as part of uh, harmful communities from a political point of view. These communities that are regarded as dangerous to the rest of society must be cast out without need for legal process. It is enough to exert the full weight of the law against them. So this nexus of violence and politics has been carefully studied elsewhere in Latin America, but when it comes to Cuba, there is a complicit silence. I think that gestures could be powerful signals to visibilize what people do not want to see. During the Pinochet dictatorship, many artists created works that were minimalist gestures. I think, for example, about the male paintings of Eugenio Ditbor, who claimed that his poetics was a poetics of the fold because his works needed to be sent by mail from one city to another and then unfolded. And uh, exhibited. I'm also thinking about the actions in support undertaken by Luz Donoso, in particular her action with Hernán Parada, when they intervened the window of a TV store and presented for a few seconds the image of a disappeared uh, woman. The next image, please.
Bueno, las, este, son la fotografía, vuelve Leonardo Romero, y en este caso con fotografías de María Luisa Espósito, ¿no? Eh, Here again we see Leonardo Romero. ¿no? These are images taken by Mario Luisa Espósito. I'm interested in the minimalism of certain quick gestures, such as uh, citizens have enacted in Cuba during actions of protest and resistance. It reads, this is not a sign. Undoubtedly, these uh, gestures are elusive. This reference to the work by Magritte, this is not a sign. This is not a pipe. This is something that is possible within the framework of art. I'm also thinking about Maria Labrito's uh, provisional tattoos. Which later were fixed on the skin. Also, 11J is also her birthday, Maria Labrito's birthday. So there is an ambiguity about uh, the significance of this dissident gesture. The act of walking, because these uh, tattoos are conceived for a walking body, the act of walking has been understood as an anti-art expression. Walking has been part of uh, artistic experimentation from the time of Dada and surrealism in the 1960s. It was often used by performance artists and in the context of uh, urban happenings during the expansion of the cultural field, what I was calling the enlargement of a term. Many people in Cuba have tattooed 11J on their skin, on their skins. These are images that people post on social media. That's, that is why I can have access to them since I don't live in Cuba. So I try to stay up to date through social media. The image on the left is by Roberto Perez Fonseca, the Cuban man who broke the painting of Fidel and who was sentenced to 10 years. And afterwards, because he got that tattoo, he was taken to an isolation cell. So the graphic dissemination of 11J on people's skins is loaded with affect and emotion. This is the image of Yudinela Castro, the mother of Roland Castillo, a 17-year-old who the prosecutor requested be sentenced to 23 years in prison for protesting on 11J. And his mother has tattooed the name of her son in protest. So I'm interested in the connection between tattooing on your own skin and walking. Affective dissidents. These are forms of uh, affective dissidents regarding a date that is now engraved on people's skins and also in the bodily memories of thousands of people. This uh, reminded me of images that were uh, written on the walls of a different city. The no more famous uh, slogan in Chile that was written in the walls and also on the skins of many cities. The artist who created this image also tattooed this mark in different locations to remind people that something horrible had happened there. She did it in front of the Palacio de la Moneda, 
And then in 1985, she also did it in front of Revolution Square in Havana. This minimalist dissident performativity, because these are not gestures of affirmation, just drawing these uh, cross signs. It's almost like scratching in the context also of the Argentinian political struggle. I don't, I don't know how she could do this in Argentina. She, since she was from Chile and exiled, oh, how was she allowed to do this in Cuba? Well, because she was from Chile and she was an exile, she had, there was permissivity and she was able to do it in Cuba, but undoubtedly it was a gesture of protest. So this minimalist dissident performativity that we see in different cities and at different times as a recurring strategy in highly repressive contexts in Latin America, makes me think of the understanding of performativity defined by Victor Turner in his Liberated Anthropology. So the performative dimension can be understood as a set of practices and gestures that play out on the public sphere. It's a field of action that encompasses the social and aesthetic through a corporeal discursivity. In the field of cultural studies, I would like to quote Jorge Judice's understanding of this. He claims that performativity is the way in which the social is more and more often practiced. And for Judith Butler, it is how social norms are put into action, but it is also a, sp a space where they can be cont contested and rejected, which leads to what Butler calls subversive performativity. These are expressions that do not harmonize and that mobilize what is established in order to create change. Many relatives of political prisoners continue. Many of the relatives of political prisoners in Cuba continue to demand that their loved ones be released. I wanted you to see the image. This is the house of Andy Garcia. This is the kind of sign that is a protest sign that is now being used, and it's also a way of defying fear. It's amazing that people are no longer afraid. I wonder, I don't know if we can state this, I feel that people, of course, they're afraid, but nonetheless, they are now incredibly courageous. Doubtless, they are acting out of pain and anger, but I think that also the actions, for example, that the ladies in white have carried out in, pub in the public streets, in the streets. This is the historical group of the ladies in white who took their bodies out to the streets. And oddly enough, they were condemned, at least by the more official branch of what are called the, the mothers of May Square. It's odd because this group not the founding mothers, but the official institution of the mothers of the May Square did not want to express solidarity with the ladies in white in Cuba. Although they are fighting for a similar cause, these women of the Black Spring maybe were the first who used this performative action of uh, defiantly taking to the streets and they are paying a high price. Although the mothers of May Square were able to march in front of uh, Casa Rosada, the ladies in white are always thoroughly repressed. In June of this year, three graphic poems appeared on the walls of a street in Vedado, Havana. They were photographed and shared in social media. I'm not sure who did it. These graffiti presented three verses repeating the same word. You need, you need to be, 
You need to be happy. The first time I saw these images, I remembered the interventions made by Alfredo Haar in Santiago de Chile in 1981 after he made a survey on the streets where he asked people, are you happy? Under Pinochet, right? I remembered the book of poems by Daniela Eltit based on Lotti Rosenfeld's no. crosses, which I showed brief uh, some time ago, when she wrote, no, I was not happy. This is what Lotti Rosenfeld said. And here we have a kind of amazing, exquisite corpse. Are you happy? No, I was not happy. We need, we need to be, we need to be happy. I would only add a brief uh, sentence from Hannah Arendt. Ideologies are never interested in the miracle of existence. Although this is only a wish, we need to be happy. It's a desire that might conjure the miserable unhappiness that is Cuba today, in spite of the complicit silence we want to insist on the testimonial power of gestures, the performativity of bodies that speak without ideological markings. Again, Hannah Arendt, ideologies are never interested in the miracle of existence. Thank you so much. I don't know if you have any questions. Uh, it took an hour, so it was. Uh, it's been quite a while. Hola. Bueno, gracias, Eliana, por Hi, Ileana. Thank you for this fantastic uh, lecture. I am very emotional because I'm Cuban, my family and friends are in Cuba, and I see that the years go by and the situation does not change. When the dictator Fidel Castro passed away, we thought that there might be change. When the people said that there would be a change when the people went out to the streets, as we saw they did in 2021, and yet nothing happened. So I just wanted to ask if you have any faith that change is likely to come. Is there any research that might be showing that this repressive regime is coming to an end after causing so much suffering to our people? Cuban people who live outside of Cuba, they continue to suffer. Maybe they live a better life. They have the, enjoy the privilege of democracy. We continue to suffer because we have left part of our soul there with our relatives and friends and the landscape where some of us were born. Whenever we return to Cuba, if you can come back because some people are prevented from going back, we've experienced this undeniable pain. So that's my question. Thank you, but I don't think I can answer that question. It's too hard to respond. Maybe if I were God, I could answer. I remember that Claudia asked Mariela something similar, and she her response was similar. Uh, 11 July was something that was unpredictable. The unpredictable arrives when you least expect it. I, I do get emotional whenever I listen to Charlie Garcia's song, which says, dinosaurs will fall. We need this, more so those who are living in Cuba.
Bueno, pues muchas gracias. Ok, well, thank you so much. Thank you.